activity, several of the largest uh, volcanoes are right there behind it. You can see them. Mm -hmm. um, and there's multiple different types of stone that has been brought in. Um, the newer pyramids are made with, uh, and I'm not great with the geology, so I couldn't tell you, but there's multiple different colored pyramids throughout the complex as well that were probably made with different material. And was that complex, was it occupied by just one group of, of folks like the Aztec? No. So, um, well, this was pre-Aztec uh, by minimum, minimum thousand years. But as we continue to go down into lower levels, we're locating uh, new cultures that we're not quite aware of yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're in the process of trying to figure out. There was so much occupation at Teotihuacan that there's all this overlap. And it makes it extremely difficult to be able to say who was here and when. Um, but we are aware of the fact that the city existed all, at least 500 to 1,000 years more than what we've originally been told. And, and that's just based upon uh, what we're finding now underneath the, the, uh, the avenue and underneath the other roads and underneath the pyramids that there's, uh, there was more there before even that was uh, put into play. So these structures, of course, these structures were occupied when, uh, when Europe, especially Spain, started coming over the conquistadors and started to doing their, um, well, I guess it's pillaging. Okay. Nice way of putting it. Cortez and, Coronado and the rest of them that came here in those years, which was what the 14, 15th century. Right. Uh, if I got my, 15th, if I got my yeah. timeline, my history, right. Um, and the famous uh, Aztec King Montezuma. Now, where was he, where was Montezuma in, in, in all of these areas? Where? Montezuma was in what's current day Mexico city. It was known as uh, Tenochtitlan. Okay. And he was the emperor of the Aztec, which was more of an empire. They would go out and conquer all these different cultures and bring them in. And uh, of course, these would, structures were there at that time. Oh, yeah. They, they were there. And, and, you know, they were as the Aztecs themselves were as interested in the history as we are. Because did they know who built them? They don't know who built them. Then that's the the issue. Is well, I know, never knew that. Yeah, they they're not they're not sure who was there because remember the Aztec actually migrated from uh, the desert southwest down into Mexico. They were okay. the last uh, the last of this uh, pre Columbian culture and civilization. You know, before the conquest took took place. So the oldest that we know are the Olmecs. Are the Olmec, correct, which goes back about, uh, that we know of 3,600, 3,700 years ago. So they would certainly have a little bit more knowledge of who built these structures, but these these had to be uh, um, somebody somewhere in the stream of time has to have a record of this, I would imagine, somewhere. Hopefully. Or, or, or an oral record, if not a written record. Yeah. And again, the issue was the conquistadors and the, the you know, the Spanish uh, Catholic clergy came in and, you know, they said this was the devil's work. If it was uh, any type of codex, codex or scroll mm -hmm. uh, of these indigenous people that needed to be brought into God and all that devil's work was burned and destroyed. In the name we, of yes, we have a habit of completely erasing our past when it does not fit with today's um, understanding of things, um, and that that continues even to today. If you look in the Middle East, of what's going on with some of the uh, some of our ancient uh, of of our ancient sites in the Middle East being destroyed by religious zealots. But I think it goes further than that. I'm not, and that's topic for another discussion. <laughs> you know, I don't think it's just some uh, 
you know, some relig religious zealots riding through the desert deciding that this temple needs to be torn down. Right. You know, I think there's a whole lot more to it than that. But uh, so have you have um, have you ventured down into South America? Yes. So I've uh, been in Argentina all the way down to Patagonia, uh, attempted to go to Antarctica, but uh, the weather was so bad we had to turn back around. So have you had a chance to go down to see the Nazca lines. I have not. I haven't seen the Nazca line. That's kind so of no. on my bucket list, too. No, mine, too. <laughs> yeah. But um, these huge South geoglyphs. Amer yeah. South America. Yes, exactly. Um, certainly. Uh, I, and you do a lot of work and study and research in the, uh, the, the petroglyphs and picture graphs and things of up here in the up here in Utah. And I would imagine we find a lot of that in uh, Mesoamerica and in, in South America, do we? Well, no, not, not really? quite as much. And that's because of uh, the, the weather. You know, it's a lot more arid in the desert southwest. So um, that type of historical data is capable of surviving more so than um, in other parts of the, the world, especially you know, when you're getting into jungle or where there's a lot of erosion from water. Um, so there's different artifacts. Uh, there's a lot more gold artifacts that are found in Central and South America, which are really interesting because uh, not only are you able to see what's what has been carved from the gold or what's carved into the gold, but just the work, the metallurgy that went into it is a telltale sign as well into the history. Um, now, these folks down there, all of Mesoamerica, the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Olmecs, they had a connection to the cosmos. They had a connection to the stars. They knew a lot about astronomy. Now, some of those buildings, they look like modern day uh, um, observatories. Do, is that what those were? Yeah, there's uh, the one at Chichen Itzu looks exactly like a modern day observatory. It has and a domed roof. Domed roof. And um, what's really interesting is a lot of these uh, megalithic structures or their observatories are aligned to, you know, certain stars or groupings of stars for a reason. And we've really only in the last 70 years recognized that and, and really gone into looking deeper into what the connection is between the stars above, you know, our head mm -hmm. and why the alignments were so accurate and precise, why they took the time to do that. And why was like, you know, certain observatories specifically set up to watch certain planets, um, and things of that nature. And it's just interesting because, you yeah, you said they had an interest in Venus. Yeah, the Maya had a well. A, a lot of the Mesoamerican cultures were had this complete fascination about the planet Venus, and, and they've created cyclical calendars. And, and the calendar systems almost seem like it's more of instead of just for agricultural purposes, it's almost as if they were tracking something because it was that important to them. And the anthropologists and archaeologists will say, well, it was for, you know, agricultural reasons so that they knew when to grow the maize, mm -hmm. uh, when to plant, when to harvest. But they I, were they were just I think it goes further. than It that, goes actually. a lot, lot further. Um, they were tracking it in such great detail. And when you add that to what was being captured in the codices that that are still around, which are four of them pre-Columbia, they were tracking it because something happened uh, between Venus and the planet Earth uh, that led to a major cataclysmic event. And they wanted to be ready for the next time. So it uh, seemed to be that it was occurring in this cyclical nature, whether that be as, you know, the solar system is traveling through the galaxy and we're coming into contact with something that we're just we've lost knowledge of in our current day and age. Mm -hmm. But it had to have gone well beyond that. The, there was a reason for it. And, and Venus plays into the underworld and this notion of hell and then this coming up and being reborn into the third, fourth or fifth world. 
and that there was a loss of the world in the past because of fire, because of water, you know, because of animals. It's really interesting, the history. And in the past, we haven't been willing to take them for their word. They're like, oh, they're, they're indigenous. They were running around chasing, you know, animals before, you know, us. Well, and, and we're so much better than they are. You know and, what? and it's just not true. I know. You know what? I, my response to this whole business of we, we, we're doing this because this is a calendar for us. This is, tells us when the plant and when the harvest and look, I grew up on a farm in central Illinois. Okay. We did not need the stars, or the, the, the planets. We didn't need Venus. We didn't need, we didn't need any constellations to tell us when it was time to get out there in the field and get the crop in. We didn't need another planet or another grouping of stars to tell us when it was time to combine the corn or to harvest the wheat. We knew it. And, and there is other explanations for why people were so fascinated with what was going on in the cosmos back in those years. I don't buy the whole farming uh, solution there. I just don't. No. And, and there's a lot more to astrology when, you know, you start delving into the history from these uh, Mesoamerican cultures and other cultures and civilizations throughout the world. Uh, astrology is far more important than astronomy because yeah. it, it was putting together not just astronomy, but a story, a, a historical um, story and, and tying in so much more into these groupings of stars for a reason uh, so that a, that this information could let last for thousands, if not millions of years. And unfortunately something happened in our distant past where we lost a great deal of this knowledge. A large part of time was lost to us. And I th think that, Maybe the last cultures that, that were aware of it were from Egypt, Mesopotamia, and uh, Mesoamerica. And, and unfortunately, we've, we've lost what it is, and it's extremely important. And there has to be some type of artifacts or depository of knowledge and information that was secreted away. You hear it being under the Sphinx. Um, there's also the possibility that I've been, you know, in northern in northeastern Utah, which is what we're looking into, that there's another one of these depositories in the Uinta Mountains. There could very well be one in South America and Peru. And these people were smart and they knew what happened and they knew they needed to have that information available to people in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, a lot of the elites knew about it and they've kept that information only to a very select group and they may have destroyed a lot of that, but there still has to be hidden information uh, around the world that we've just lost knowledge about that hopefully we find and is going to help us out in the future. So. so so James, do you have any future plans of heading back down there to, for, to do some more research? Yeah, I, I will be there in March. Uh, we'll be back in the Yucatan. Uh, we're going to be going to Ekbalam, which is a newer site. Uh, uh -huh. Not a lot of excavation has taken place there. So there's a lot of discovery um, that needs to be done. And that's the best because you know, there, there's a lot of virgin ground that hasn't been broken open yet. It's been non-invasive to, to this point. And uh, if it's anything like uh, what has been found from uh, the small amount that has been excavated, oh, it's going to be uh, amazing finds. And um, you're going to be taking your your equipment down there, your ground penetrating radar and all of your... Some of it, not all of it. Uh, <laughs> it takes a lot to get it. Um, I was, my, my next question is, what does it take to get all that equipment down there? Yeah, it takes uh, a pretty large vehicle. And uh, I, 
I worry about taking that much equipment uh, into Mexico because I, I don't want it to disappear That's or be concern. taken away. Yeah. <laughs> so I try to limit um, what I take. I, I do have a 3D ground imaging system. Uh, we discussed it on the first show, I think, a little bit. It's, it's, yeah, I wear it around my ankle and then I hold the tablet. And it's amazing because I can put my, my jeans or my pants over it. You have no idea. And they just think there's this some crazy he, American on top of their pyramids walking, you know, backwards and forwards and sideways. And non-destructive examination. Yep. Um, which is the best way to do it anyway. Um, you've also, all right, now let's, let's head back North a little bit. Let's, what you, what have you been doing up in, up in Utah in the Uinta basin recently? Yeah. So we were there uh, in October there were several sites that um, we had been aware of that were very important to the Spaniards. And we're talking about before 1776, when they supposedly got there, mm -hmm. that there's a couple hundred more years of information uh, available. And we have found out about a location in the high Uintas that shouldn't exist. And we're the uh, USGS has labeled it as a mesa, which it's not. It's a rock structure, just massive, tons and tons of boulders making up this uh, mountaintop or mesa, as they call it, in the middle of Utah. There's nothing else like it. And whether it's partially man-made or completely, it, it's just unique. And on top of it are three monument structures that were put there by the Spaniards. And we're in the process of trying to understand what these three monuments were trying to refer to because they're in a triangular formation. One of them has a site hole. Uh, probably uh, the other two did at some point in time and they've either collapsed or were purposely knocked down. So mm -hmm. they're several feet smaller than the one that still exists with the site hole. Um, and, and it's, it, it's so difficult to get up there because of the amount, it's nothing but boulders, tons of large boulders, rock boulders everywhere. Um, so it's very difficult to get equipment difficult up there without around. a helicopter. Right. Yeah. I have, um, you, you have a great YouTube channel and, uh, I would encourage anyone who is listening to, to this particular podcast to check out James Keenan's YouTubes. Um, you, recently did some work up at Mount Wilson. Yes. Now you're all, not only do you do, you're an anthropologist and a, an archeologist, but you also deal a little bit with the paranormal, which is the other side of the James Keenan that I would like to get into, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, you know what I tell everybody, I, I am a firm believer that cataclysmic events, lost distant history and the paranormal are intertwined. There's no way around it that uh -huh. there is so much pointing to a different type of travel. Uh, and if you know me, I, I, I talk about this interdimensional capability, whether, whether it be through, um, rock portals or some other type of portal they existed the there's just so much data you know, through oral tradition through objects artifacts through structures that look like their doorways and they have these little indentions in them circular indentions where it looks like something needed to be placed into it to maybe activate it and there's an alteration that needed of sound you know frequency and vibration and they're all over the world. Uh, they're very similar. And whether it be Native Americans or other indigenous people of whatever location in the world, they all talk about the same thing having occurred in the past and that the, they were capable of altering the rock or whatever the portals or the doorways or gateways are made of through vi vibration and frequency shift, which can easily be done through chanting music hmm. and, um, you know, maybe altering your thought through uh, different thought processes that we've just lost knowledge of that includes fasting. Yeah. So 
seriously. I, I don't discredit anything. And for us to think now that we're far more advanced than people in the past, we have the same brains, you know, the same capacity. Uh, we are all that, humans. We haven't, we haven't changed that much that, in 10,000 years. That's an excellent point, James. Um, we today, you're right. We have the same brain capacity. We have the same capacity to learn the same, uh, uh, imagination, the same curiosity as we did 10,000 years ago. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Um, you wear a lot of hats, <laughs> you know, uh, this, this is what makes you such a fascinating guy. Your, your latest YouTube had to deal, dealt with uh, what's going on at, at Wilson, Mount Wilson. I noticed that you were up there uh, with with Robert Bigelow, uh, Colin Kellner. Uh, I think uh, uh, Jacques Vallée was with you on that. Well, I, I wasn't. Are, they weren't were with you, me. That, you weren't with. Okay. No, they they were they were there in the 1990s. And okay. Yeah, nobody, not many people know that uh, Bigelow and Nids had a different ranch before Skinwalker Ranch. As a matter of fact, they learned about Skinwalker Ranch while they were on Mount Wilson Ranch in outside of Pioche, Nevada. And there's this huge story that goes into that uh, as and to how gonna, Bigelow learned of it. Yeah, and we're running out of time. So I want to just say that this is this is <laughs> this is conversation for number three, James, <laughs> in a few weeks. I I absolutely am gonna have you back. What a quick hour, huh? Yeah. Good golly. Patricia, can you put up um, his websites there for folks to? There you are. Now, you've got this um, You've got this fascinating YouTube channel, James, and I strongly suggest any of our listeners look up James Keenan and get out there on YouTube and have a look at the stuff that you have posted. So... Um, yeah, we're going to have to end it here. James, again, it was another fascinating but quick conversation. Well, thanks for having me. You know, maybe in the future I'll get 90 minutes of airtime. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we can certainly use the extra half hour. But um, thanks again for coming on. Thanks for having and, me. Yeah, appreciate yep, it. Yep, it's been, it's been fascinating. And I know that uh, you're going to have a wonderful time down there in, in Central America. And... Uh, but anyway, everyone, I want to thank you for joining us. I know it was quick, but we want to thank James Keenan for, for coming on with us. Again, I'm Jim Mann, your host. And in the background there with the pictures and all the all the help is my pr uh, program manager, Patricia. And so on behalf of all of us, thank you for joining us. This is Dark Window, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you. Bye. Good night.